I basically come to see it as an idol, as a form of literal gilded graven idol with a picture of the patron saint of science and of peace and of economics and everything else, which is Alfred Nobel. And it's given out amidst a great fanfare on two, on a holiday, a holy day in Sweden, which is actually like a national holiday, which you have, yeah, which you have a feast. It's not his birthday, it's his death day. And it has all this regalia that you have to wear certain clothing. You have to bow down to the monarch, the God King of Sweden. Uh, and and you, uh, you know, sort of this eschatological ceremony. My guest today is Brian Keating. Brian Keating is a Chancellor's Distinguished Professor of Physics at the Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences in the Department of Physics at the University of California, San Diego. His latest book, Losing the Nobel Prize, A Story of Cosmology, Ambition, and the Perils of Science's Highest Honor, reads like a novel. This book gives a fascinating history of cosmology, how our universe came into being. Brian also writes about how Alfred Nobel came up with his prize and asks if the Nobel Prize is a good thing or bad thing for science. I recently sat down with Brian and we talked about humanity's fascination with the origins of the universe and why scientists find it so difficult to believe in God. Brian, thanks so much for being on the show. I really, really was anticipating it. I read most of your book. I didn't get through all the science parts, but I thought it was a fascinating read. I learned so much, and I hope there's no quiz on cosmology because I think I'm probably getting maybe 20% right. It's okay, Charles. You'll get some extra credit opportunities after the final exam. All right, so let's get right into it, man. What the heck for average humans, what is a cosmologist? A cosmologist, uh, you know, people mistake me because of my beautiful appearance. You can probably tell that if you're watching the YouTube video. You know, someone who does hair, nails, makeup. Uh, but actually, it shares the same prefix, cosmology, cosmetology. They both have the prefix cosmos, and that stems from the word from Greek, which means beautiful or appearance. And that's because the night sky, anyone who's ever looked up at the night sky realizes it's beautiful. The stars, the planets, the moon it appears as if the universe is kind of centered on us and is looking at us all the time, just the way a face or something that is beautiful in appearance also appears uh, specifically beautiful, maybe made for our own visual delicacies, uh, so to speak. And uh, when we look at at the night sky, we're magically kind of transfixed by it. And I was transfixed since I was a young kid by the magical kind of nature of looking up and wondering what does it all mean? What's it all there for? Who put it there, if anyone? And could I contribute to the long string of knowledge that has been going on since time immemorial? So the biggest questions, the questions of ultimate importance, the questions of meaning, of existence, is there a purpose? Is there a creator of the universe? These are all things that are the purview of cosmology. And my book is a memoir of what it feels like to do cosmology, not to describe in kind of breathless anticipation of whiz bang, you know, features that you'll never experience, wormholes, black holes, um, you know, extra dimensions and all sorts of really cool things to speculate on. But actually, what does it feel like to build a telescope and take it down to the bottom of the world or launch it into outer space? What does it feel like to do cosmology, not only to wonder about it, but to do it? That's what I wanted to write about in my book. Right. Well, outstanding. You talk about, you know, the telescope, which we'll talk about in a a few minutes. But when, about 25 years ago, uh, I bought a Celestron telescope, and I'm in Brooklyn, and we have a lot of light pollution. I mean, there are lights all over the place. It's really, really hard to see. So I stopped trying to find, uh, I stopped trying to find all of the small stars, and it was just ridiculous. And this is before computers, so once you found it, and the Earth is hurling through space, you just lost it. So I said, all right, the only time we're really going to go out there is when there's at least half a moon. And I want to tell you, when I set it up on the sidewalk, people would be walking by and they would ask, could I see? And when they look at it, not, not only their face, their whole, their expression, there was a, <laughs> there were a lot of curse words. It, it, like, I can't believe this. Just amazement. And if, if those of you who have never looked at the moon not a full moon, a half moon or a quarter moon, because you see the shadows and it's just absolutely amazing. It is awe-inspiring. Yeah. You know, uh, one of uh, the most famous, not only astrophysicists in human history, 
But uh, the most famous scientist living today is one of your neighbors. He goes by the name of Neil deGrasse Tyson. I actually had him on my podcast, Into the Impossible, Dr. Brian Keating. He lives not far from you in the Bronx. He was from the Bronx. He's the director of the Hayden Planetarium. He had a small telescope in the Bronx, which has no less light pollution than you did over there in Flatbush growing up. And that telescope can reveal exactly the same craters on the moon, the same moons of the planet Jupiter, the same phases of the planet Venus, and even things like sunspots, if you do it just right, uh, an eclipse of the sun, uh, depending on when you guys uh, hear this or or watch this, uh, will have just taken place or may just take place. Uh, These are all things you can see that were seen in the time of Galileo, my hero, who plays a big role in my life and in my book. And this particular fellow was observing things that you can see to this very day. It's not like you need a Hubble Space Telescope to see things, as you proved, Charles, and as Neil deGrasse Tyson describes in his book, Adventures of an Urban Astrophysicist. You don't need this. And that's why I say, you know, I'm a doctor, but I'm not a real doctor. I don't, I don't help people but, but uh, with their medical issues. But um, my prescription is for all parents to go on Amazon or go wherever. You don't need a big telescope at all to inspire the awe and wonder that I felt when I was a 12-year-old with a $50 telescope that was used to kindle a love of astronomy that I have maintained 40 years later in my life to become a professional astronomer. Because as you experience, when you connect your eyes to a tube that transports you across space and time, your imagination is left you know, completely blown away. And for some of us, it'll inspire us to a career. And why would you not want your children, your grandchildren to be, uh, to be, why would you not want them to have that experience that might lead them into a career in what's called STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Maybe it's not a guarantee, but if you don't expose them to it, you know, who knows, you might be depriving them of such an opportunity. Yeah. You know, uh, I remember at the time I uh, had little kids and uh, they'd come out with me and the best time, of course, uh, we, we had was in the, in the uh, winter months. Orion was right overhead. It was chilly. We bundle up. And uh, I just remember the thrill that I had seeing the rings of Saturn. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Yeah. And, and I thought it was a mistake. And it was so crystal clear. And I said, oh, my gosh. I remember I just ran inside. I said to my wife, Ellen, you got to come out here and see this. She said, Leave me alone. She goes, wow, that's something. You know, it's funny. When you do that, you're replicating exactly what Galileo did. There's no other science that I know about, Charles, where you can replicate the discovery historical and historical fashion identically to the way that the scientist who discovered the phenomenon did. In other words, you can't smash together two atoms the way that Oppenheimer or Fermi did it because you don't have a particle accelerator lying around your unless I know that studio looks pretty fancy, Charles. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe you guys got it over there, but I don't think okay. you do. But you can do exactly what Galileo did and get a taste, a thrill of what it feels like to look at the moon with your eye, it doesn't look that way. But when you look and you see a crater or a mountain, you say, holy cow, this doesn't look like a smooth bowling ball. It looks like it's got mountains. It looks like it has craters. It looks like it has valleys. Hmm, that looks just like the earth. It's not supposed to be like that. Things in space are supposed to be perfect, unmoving, unchanging. That really changes up the worldview that people had for millennia. And so Charles, you are replicating the not only the optical discovery, you are replicating the emotional, visceral discovery. Nowhere else in science is that possible. So everyone out there, take Dr. Keating's advice, get a small telescope. And I should be smart and take some investment advice from you and uh, figure out a way to co-brand and you know co-package and make my own brand of Keating brand telescopes. But yeah. for now, just find anyone on, on Amazon, a small refracting telescope, under 50 bucks, probably two inch diameter, you'll, you'll be just fine. Yeah, but even if you get like those uh, three hundred dollar ones, which are just absolutely so much better than what what I had, and and a zillion times better than what Galileo had. It has a stand. It's easy. It's simple. If you just buy it to look at the moon, you I guarantee you're gonna get your money's worth a hundred times over. Just yeah, absolutely uh, crazy. All right, you don't even need yeah. that much. That, that's even overkill. Seriously, go to my Twitter. Send me a DM on Twitter on Instagram. I'll find you one that's ninety nine bucks or less, and then All right, uh, cool. yeah. Yeah, definitely. You know what? You know what? After this, send me that brand. I'll put it in the description so people could go on there. Absolutely. And uh, maybe we'll brand it the uh, Keating Telescope. The Zeraki Keating Telescope. All right. Yeah, I like that. I like that. All right. Uh, so why are you? But I want to tell you. I read parts of your book, and you, you know, I, I think it's so just amazing because the average person just doesn't think about the things you think about. 
how the universe started, uh, when was that Big Bang, uh, wh- how do we measure it, how were they so accurate, how do they know it's 13.8 billion and not 13.2 billion years old? It, it, it just opened up a whole thing. It's, it's, you know what I find interesting? You could go through your book on a superficial level and just read it as entertainment, and then you could just highlight some parts and say, I want to learn about this, uh, the, the red-blue spectrum and lights and Kelvin and a whole bunch of other things. But I don't want to get into that because science is not on this test. I want to ask you this. Why are we as humans so, so focused, so preoccupied uh, uh, on m- wanting to know the origins of our universe? I think that most people, you know, it said lead lives of quiet desperation. You know, we're, we're occupied with making a living with the quotidian, the daily activities. We don't have time. Maybe on the weekends we go to church, we go to synagogue, whatever. Uh, we don't get a chance to really dwell on the ultimate issues because we're busy making a living. You know, the Bible says six days you shall work. It's a commandment. It's not optional. Uh, that means one day a week you, you get maybe a chance to think about ultimate reality. And even on those days, maybe you have to think about, uh, you know, your kids and getting back and forth and doing certain things. Um, Where is the time? You know, where does it go? And we don't often get time to do that. And look, I'm a professional cosmologist. I get paid to study the laws of nature. I get paid to study and to teach the laws of nature, the laws of the origin of the universe, to speculate on things. And even I, Charles, I don't get to, most of my day is not doing that. It's, uh, it's, It's figuring out, hmm, how do I get this graduate student you know, to get to Chile to get, you know, her thesis data on time so that she can graduate so she can start her next job? Or how do I get, you know, to teach my lecture on time? Or how do I get, you know, my own uh, personal research grant funded so that I can have the, you know, it's it's not the thinking about, well, what happened during the first trillionth of a second of the universe's history? Or how can we know whether there's a rival alternative, whether there was a Big Bang or not? There are some who say there were there wasn't a Big Bang. Uh, and what would that mean for philosophy, for theology, for religion, for science itself? These are fascinating questions. So I think, you know, as they normally say, you know, uh, man plans, God laughs. We we like to think that we are these creatures that have these aspirations to think about the ultimate meaning of life. But we also have to, you know, make sure we get the dry cleaning. But when you do have that opportunity, as Kurt Vonnegut used to say, you know, whenever you find your, yourself Charles or any of the audience out there, when you find yourself and you're thinking about the ultimate meaning, stop for a second. Appreciate that you have the time, you have the freedom in the greatest country in the world, protected by the most brave men and women in the world. I never lose sight of that fact, Charles, by the way. I love that you have a flag in your studio. I have one in my office at UC San Diego, the veterans that that, that served on our behalf. Um, I thank them every day. Because if not, I would be in the military. I'd be conscripted. I'd be doing something, right? So think for a second. Whenever you get a chance to think about it, maybe you're listening to me right now. Think about the origin of the universe. Thank somebody that you have the opportunity to do it and say, this is what life's all about. This and the love of people that you love, this is what life's all about. This is what makes mankind different from any other animal or any other individual creature or whatever. Whatever you might believe is that we have the capacity to consider our ultimate brevity of life and mortality and do something about it and understand why we might be here and, and, and appreciate the complexity, the beauty, and the wonder of what it's all about. So I think that's what is so fascinating about astronomy. There are other people who do interesting things in the building that I'm in doing research in their laboratories, in their, uh, in their equations. They study properties of, of uh, you know, how different fluids flow or plasmas, or, you know, perhaps they study you know, electromagnetic waves and things like that. Those are all interesting. Those are all parts of physics, uh, of materials and so forth, but they don't ultimately have a bearing and impingement upon the meaning of reality, the origin of the universe, and they don't really infringe upon notions of philosophy and certainly not on theology. So it's a very different type of subject to study and not everyone's interested in those things. Let's be honest. Some people doesn't move them, but for those that do appreciate that. And maybe it's a sign of your curiosity is telling you something. I want to learn more about this. And there's ample opportunities to do so. Yeah, well well said, well said. So what uh, you talk about is you talk about the history of cosmology and what a wretched life uh, Galileo eventually leads for, for his curiosity and his discoveries. Could you just touch upon them so someone like myself could really appreciate 
what he did, what he sacrificed, and what he brought to to the knowledge base of humanity? Yeah, Galileo was uh, superhuman in certain senses. He uh, he seemed to have this preternatural, supernatural ability to understand, to make measurable things that were previously incomprehensible, unbelievable, impossible to understand. But he also had foibles and flaws like any other human being. He was driven by impulses, uh, by ego, by fame, by attention, and even by money. Now, this will interest you, uh, Charles, and your listeners in the investment community. One of his books uh, was written about effectively what's called a slide rule. Remember slide rules back in your mm-hmm. in your earlier days, Charles, before we had calculators, iPhones, et cetera, we used to have to use slide rules. I barely know how to use one. I can kind of get away with one if I had to. But these were uh, calculational devices uh, pr- uh, prior, you know, a step above an abacus, <laughs> but uh, really far beyond a calculator and uh, behind a calculator. And he invented one that would allow you to do all sorts of amazing things uh, in mathematical calculations, in geometry and algebra. But one thing it could do is it could actually do um, conversion between currencies. It could convert, mm-hmm. and he goes through this calculation, Charles, it's really wonderful, in this book called the about the slide rule that he had uh, perfected called a military compass. Uh, don't ask me why it was called that, uh, but it was called on the military compass. And uh, only about 10 or 20 of these original first copy editions of this book exist. And he goes through a calculation. He says, let's say you're in Verona or you're going to Venice and you want to convert uh, Scuti to Ducati. So these are the different types of currency that were involved. You know, be like, let's say you want to convert, you know, um, uh, euros to dollars or Bitcoin to Ethereum or, or whatever. And so here's how you do it. And then he goes through a calculation and it, you use a slide rule to do it. And you could do it on a slide rule. You could do it on a, on a computer in a millisecond nowadays, but he was showing how you could do it on a slide rule. And he goes through and he shows how you do it. And I'm, I'm trying to like go back in time. And I say, Galileo, Galileo, I wish I could go back in time, Charles. Cause if I could just tell him one thing, I would say, screw these Ducati and Scudi. Cause Nowadays, if you have like a thousand scooty, like piece of paper, it's almost worth nothing. Maybe it's worth a hundred dollars to some collector or some historian or whatever. It's almost like dollars will be worth nothing. And nobody uses scooty anymore. They're just like, you know, kind of piece of paper or whatever. They don't have any value because they're fiat currency of an of a long bygone age. But the book that's written about the compass and how to use it, those are worth millions of dollars today. Those are worth tremendous amounts of money. So I wish I could say, Galileo. Put aside 10 copies of the book mm-hmm. for your kids. For And it's just like he didn't realize that. He was so obsessed with selling the book, you know, or selling the ideas to make money, to make fame for himself. So he had all these ideas, Charles, um, but he and he was so brilliant. But like a lot of my colleagues, you know, they're kind of driven by ambition. And that's the subtitle of my book, A Story of Cosmology and Ambition and the Perils of Seeking Science's Highest Honors. And he became world famous. And that kind of led to his downfall, which is that he attracted the attention of the Catholic Church, uh, which was a uh, which was a political organization. It was also a military organization and it was a scientific organization. It wasn't just like a bunch of, you know, rubes that didn't know anything about science. They had the best scientists in the world. And Galileo was a devout Catholic and his daughters were nuns. Uh, and, and the reason why is because they were born illegitimately. But he had no problem. Believe he was a devout uh, Catholic himself. So. To think, you know, that he somehow was antagonistic towards God, uh, nothing could be further from the truth. However, uh, he ultimately paid a great price, not the least of which is because he didn't recognize how the limits of his intelligence uh, were constraining him and that he kind of overestimated how much his intelligence uh, could could get him out of uh, sticky situations. And in the end, he ended up writing a book which uh, was called The Dialogue, which was subsequent to books that I describe in Losing the Nobel Prize. In this book, he put the words of of the Pope, which was uh, sort of supporting the the notion that the Earth was the center of the solar system and therefore the universe. He put those words of the Pope in the mouth of somebody whose name is called the simpleton in Latin Mm -hmm. or in English or in Italian. And that was a you know, kind of a mistake. I mean, imagine like, you know, putting, you know, you have this guy, uh, Fauci or Biden and you, and you, and you call his, you know, whatever he says, you have a guy, his name is the idiot. And you put, you know, whatever the idiot speaks, it's just like copying a transcript from our president or, uh, or Anthony Fauci. <laughs> I don't know. Some people out there probably would agree with that, but I'm not, I'm not going to be mm-hmm. political. I'm always apolitical. You know that Charles. But the point mm-hmm. is, um, you know, he was very politically, he was very ignorant and naive rather. 
And uh, and it was his downfall because he ended up getting imprisoned for the rest of his life. He wasn't tortured. He wasn't like a prison like Bernie Madoff was in or, you know, uh, uh, you know, one of these guys like uh, like Epstein. Um, it was actually pretty lavish. And I actually had a party and a, and a festival in his house, uh, his final resting place, so to speak, in 2015. And it's a sumptuous villa overlooking the Duomo in Florence, Italy. But nevertheless, he was he did suffer from some of this lack of political savvy that uh, was not matching his intellectual and scientific savviness. So we go from Galileo, which points this out, and then we go throughout time where scientists are trying to figure out, they, there's, there's sea changes in thought. The earth is the center of the universe. Then it becomes, well, we're not the center of the universe, but we could be the center of the galaxy. And then we move to other things, to where we are, and I'm just really going through because I want to get to this one point, which is fascinating to me about, to the Big Bang. The Big Bang where the, that everything, about everything was compressed into the smallest, 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 smallest dot possible, and boom, 13.8 billion years ago, it just exploded. Is that more, did I have that more or less for a layman? Do I have that right? Yeah, for a lay, lay person, yeah, it's, it's more or less right. It, it wasn't actually like at a central point or there's some center of the universe. That's part of the fallacy that, you know, human beings have had all along, that we always think we're the center of the solar system, of the universe, of the galaxy. And now we have this theory of the multiverse, which is kind of an extension of that same line of thinking that somehow we're, we're either important in the cent- large landscape of time or of space, or of size, or of energy, and but you're right. The that the that the notion that we are somehow important in the universe's organization is both seems to be a very very common theme throughout history. And on one hand, it's a very secular theme. In other words, like we seem to just observe, and due to either illusions or due to actual fact, you know, we seem to occupy this this um, you know unquestionably central place in a certain sense. Um, we're not too far from this, the sun. We're not too close to the sun. Uh, we're not too far from the center of the galaxy. We're not too close to the center of the galaxy. Uh, there is no center of the universe. Um, we're not too close to the Big Bang in time. We're not too far away from you know. So we we are arguably like this. And then we also look around and we also don't see other forms of life uh, that's anything like us. We don't know of any other conscious life like us. So we're kind of unique in that sense. Uh, we don't uh, look around in other uh, planets in the solar system. We don't see other forms of life uh, like we have on Earth, even like mold or bacteria, let alone human life, technological life. Then we look outside of the Earth. We don't see uh, massive communications um, technology anywhere else outside of the Earth. We don't see UFO, credible evidence for UFOs that pass double blind scientific studies or, you know, uh, we don't have samples, uh, you know, that we can study in the scientific community. So uh, all of this points to an explanation on one hand that we're special, uh, but that's kind of also anathema to scientists. We don't like to see in a secular explanation that we're unique. We like to say that we're the consequence of a, a deterministic process in science, that evolution is blind and pitiless and indifferent, as Richard Dawkins says, uh, that we are just the evolution of chemicals and molecules that somehow, given enough time, and the right temperature and the right conditions will evolve to form under any circumstances. And so it is inevitable that we would come to exist. And yet we see no other examples of it. So you have a paradox that you have to explain. And one of the ways to explain it is that, uh, that there are other universes in which there are other examples of planets, um, stars, galaxies, and perhaps other sentient conscious beings not dissimilar to ourselves. And this has become okay. uh, some of the... Uh, de rigueur rage in scientific circles such as those that I traffic. Right. Okay. Put that all aside for just half a second. So we have this moment. I can't even say time because you're going to probably correct me and say there's no such thing as time at this point. But 13.8 billion years ago, something happens that enormous amounts of energy and creation of our universe or galaxy, I don't know what the term, universe I would say, yeah. would that mm-hmm. be correct? Mm-hmm. Our universe is born. And a cosmologist's job is to try to figure out what happened that nanosecond after or before. So uh, cosmology is concerned with the evolution and or- the origin and evolution of the universe. It has less, perhaps, to say about what preceded the origin of the universe. 
although it is now becoming part of acceptable cosmology activity to speculate on scenarios prior to the origin of the universe. It used to be ridiculed. Stephen Hawking used to say things like asking what happened before the beginning of the universe is like asking what is north of the North Pole. It's a nonsensical question. You can't go north of the North Pole by definition. It's as far north as north can be. And by his point, he would say the origin of time itself leaves no room for anything before time. But now cosmologists do and can speculate on scenarios that could have answered the question, what happened on the Tuesday before the Big Bang? Right. Okay. So, so good. So without getting into any more science, because it's way out of my circle of confidence, I have one thought which just keeps bothering me. Why, if we're probably never going to figure out what happened and happened a nanosecond before the start of the universe... And as Steve Hawkins said, or I, I think maybe, didn't, didn't Einstein say something else, also the nonsensical question of, you know, north or asking what's south of the South Pole or something like that, or whatever it is. If it was Hawkins, it was Hawkins. Sorry. That's a silly, silly question to ask. So, so what I'm trying to understand is, why is it so hard if it looks like, as humans, we're never going to figure out what happened the nanosecond before the Big Bang? Why is it so difficult for scientists to believe in a higher being or God? Well, I think there's, that's a complicated question. First of all, um, you, you should never give up as a scientist on the question of initial conditions, of what came before. So you could ask the same question of a biologist. You could say, um, you know, someone who studies a chicken, you know, the chicken or the egg, you know, why should you study what happens after the fertilization of the egg? you know, the DNA, the embryology of a chicken, um, you know, and, and how it develops. Why should you study it? Um, because, you know, when you have this chicken and you can see how it grows, evolves, its structure, its function, then you could study its environment. How does it fit in? What does it eat? What's its sociology like? How does it, <laughs> what's its pecking order? Uh, what, what kind of environment? All these things, right? So there's a very rich scientific subject matter that you could study. How does it fit into the animal kingdom, the bird kingdom? Uh, how is it related to dinosaurs? It could go into like vast scientific literature. Scientists are fascinated by that. Stop there, scientist, you might say. No, no scientist worth his or her salt is going to stop there. They're going to say, right, no. Right, let, me, let me clarify. Let me clarify. Let me clarify. I, 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 you're right. I, let, me, let me be more specific. Since we're probably never going to have certainty of what happened a millisecond before the Big Bang. Let's just assume that to be the case. Could, could you make, is that a fair assumption? Well, it, never, not... no, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, well, okay, you can't, it depends, you really can't say that, right? Because if you had asked Einstein exactly 100 years ago today, Charles, um, you, you, you would have gotten an answer. You would have said, like, we'll never know um, what, you, you would say, like, was there anything before you know, was there a big bang? He would say, are you, of course not. And this would be after all of his relativity equations. This would be after he won the Nobel prize, all these things. He would say, are you crazy? The universe is static. In fact, they didn't mm -hmm. know the universe was mm -hmm. even evolving until 1929. So you're talking right, like right, only right. 90 years ago. So no, it's very dangerous to say like, it's safe to say X, as you just said. So no, I, I, don't, I wouldn't agree with that. I, I think that's, a, I, I don't mean this as an insult, Charles. But that's not a scientific approach to say, like, we're never right. going to know X. Don't, we, we don't say that as scientists. Right, right, right. Okay. So, so I, I'm not going to rephrase this question because the more I do, the more trouble I get. But the thing that I, I just want to try to understand is um, until we can figure out what happened a nanosecond before the Big Bang, why is it difficult for many people who are scientists to accept that there's a higher being or God? Uh, that's, a, that's a better question. Uh, I wouldn't, I, I could just rule out, or we could just even exclude like the conditional aspect of until we find out X, uh, because there'll always be people, uh, for example, let me, let me take you back to my field specifically, which is called the cosmic microwave background, which is this all pervasive radiation field discovered in 1965, not far from where you are, 
in northern New Jersey. It was the best thing that ever happened to New Jersey. Homedale, no, I'm just kidding. Homedale, New Jersey. I'm just kidding. Right I, lo- I love New Jersey. That's, that's Homedale, New Jersey, right? Yes, yeah, Homedale, New Jersey, yeah. not far. Bell I Labs. That's on the Garden State Parkway. Yep. That's yep. great. Yep. Yeah. It, it's now a, it's a national historic site. I believe. It is. It the, is. Uh, yep. I visited yeah. there. I have a picture of a good friend yeah. of mine, Fred Carl. Uh, help me uh, visit there. It's a wonderful, wonderful place now owned by Nokia. But anyway, that um, that that wonderful facility uh, before that discovery, people thought that uh, the universe was essentially static or that could have been assumed to be unchanging and didn't have a, uh, a singular origin. And you could have made your living as a cosmologist. Uh, forever. And in fact, some of the most vehement vocal opponents of the Big Bang had a model called the steady state, which held the universe was unchanging, effectively unchanging over any normal, modest time scales as you could think about. So the Big Bang, which was you know kind of ushered in by observations by Edwin Hubble, uh, they made fun of it. In fact, the word Big Bang, the phrase Big Bang is an insult allegedly in British English for, I don't know how old your audience is, but you can look up what it means in British English, apparently, uh, a euphemism for something that shall not be mentioned on polite company radio. But uh, but the point being, it was an insult. It was preposterous. There's a big bang. It's a joke. So um, it was mocked. Now, uh, we don't think of it as a mockery. In fact, we think of it as the standard model of how the universe began. Everybody knows. It. But when, when this was discovered and, and first postulated, people could have said, well, now why don't all scientists believe in Genesis 1-1 in the beginning? Now we know there was a beginning, right? Well, no. So you can't be so clear. Was there a beginning? Were there multiple beginnings? Was there a, Are there parallel universes each undergoing their own beginning? So it's very dangerous to kind of pick and choose. And then I think a scientist could legitimately say, I don't personally, but scientists do say things like that. So why, why do you choose a particular God. In other words, uh, you know, a scientist will say, I'm an atheist and you're an atheist too, Charles, except you believe in just one more God than I do. Uh, in other words, like you, you've ruled out in uh, infinite gods or pantheistic gods, you know, God of Jupiter, God of Mars, but you actually only believe in one God. I just take it one more step. And that's one argument I've heard. Or, you know, they say that there's a, you know, deistic approach or God created the universe but then he disappeared. And and so God instantiated the laws of physics. Uh, God then, you know, instantiated the universe before that, and then he's gone. And then, so can you prove that God, you know, didn't set all the laws of the universe into motion, even the laws of, you know, the Torah, the book of of Genesis, Exodus, you know, all that, maybe that's a, that's an alternative. So I I think, I think um, requiring that scientists believe in God because we have a model of cosmology or questioning them. I think that that, might be asking too much of a, of a theory of physics. And I always say, look, science, the word science, and I did a PragerU video about this, the word science means knowledge. It doesn't mean wisdom. And the word for the Bible in the original Hebrew is Torah, and Torah equates to, to wisdom. It doesn't mean knowledge. In other words, I don't teach my kids calculus using the Torah, and I don't teach my kids wisdom using Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time, or uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson's astrophysics books, or even Brian Keating's losing the Nobel Prize. They're very different modalities of thinking. And and I think we have to be very careful when we try to uh, translate one branch of knowledge and try to convert it into wisdom. That's very difficult and very perilous to do. Fair, very fair. So, so where are we on, where, you were pretty close to winning a Nobel Prize, or so says for your, your invention, which we'll talk about just in a, in a second, uh, uh, for what you discovered and your co discovered you just co with your bicep, was it, that was only you or several other people? I'm not sure. Well, so I was, the idea was mine with some colleagues, uh, and then we upgraded it to a new experiment, like the way we up, they upgrade iPhones. You know, uh, it went from what I called bicep, it became bicep two, and bicep two made the announcement that, that, the team you know, had discovered unequivocal evidence for essentially, if you think of the Big Bang as sort of this explosion, we discovered the spark that ignited the explosion. That was sort of the analogy that we, uh, that we mentioned. That was nice. called inflation. Yeah. Right, right. Oh, that, that was inflation. I wonder, I kept looking at that. I, 
I should have. That, that's a great way. I think you probably described it as a spark, but I probably saw inflation and thought business and money and finance. Yeah, that's right. So, I actually quote, you know, yeah. the first Nobel Prize in economics, or one of the first, went to Milton Friedman for the theory of monetary mm-hmm. inflation. And uh, I make a couple of jokes about that in the book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, so you, when you didn't win the Nobel Prize, uh, you started to take a hard look at at the whole development of what it was originally developed for, where it is today, and the law of unintended consequences. Is the Nobel Prize really helping or hurting science? Yeah. Could you just touch on that? Because I, I didn't get the sense of this is, you know, sour grapes. Uh, you know, I lost it. Let me just piss all over the Nobel Prize. You didn't do that. You didn't yeah. do that. In yeah. all fairness to you, you went and you, you said, okay. And I was listening to one of your talks at Google Talks, and you basically spoke about the origination of the Nobel Prize, what the whole, uh, the, 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 the point of it was. And then, for instance, now I don't mean posthumous, you can't be even posthumously, you can be the greatest discoverer, they find something, you can never get a Nobel Prize. Women, I think, what, it was a handful, three, four women who've gotten the Nobel Prize? Only, only two when I wrote it. Now it's double two. after I wrote it. Now it's four. Two, yeah, okay. <laughs> two women. Uh, well, Einstein didn't get the Nobel Prize for theory of relativity due to anti-Semitism. So you're seeing all of these things. I always thought it was a, so. It, it, briefly, briefly, Brian, because I'd love to, to have a show just about the Nobel Prize. Just share with us what the Nobel Prize, what Alfred Nobel originally intended for the prize to be, and where, and what has it become? So Alfred. Nobel. He was a bachelor his whole life. He had no children, no wife. And he wanted the prize to be his legacy that kind of redeemed the fact that he had become essentially the world's richest man or one of the world's richest man through inventing uh, one of its most deadly explosives, dynamite. And that was one of his uh, most lucrative patents in history up until that time. And he became so wealthy and he had no heirs and he wanted to rehabilitate the Nobel name. And in so doing, he created this prize to, in his words, uh, reward the the person who had in the preceding year conferred the greatest benefit to mankind through an invention or discovery in physics. And this became kind of a mission statement when I was asked to nominate the winners of the 2016 Nobel Prize soon after humiliating defeat, so to speak, and having to retract the discovery that our team made uh, as being attributed to not the origin and the birth pangs of the universe, but rather what's known as cosmic dust and interstellar planetary dust floating around in our galaxy, in our universe, uh, that masqueraded as the signals we were seeking after. And that was an example that I had of comfort. By the way, let, by the way, let me just interrupt. Throughout your book, a lot of greater scientists than yourself have been fooled by dust. Yes. <laughs> it seems to be dust is the bane of every great scientist in a discovery. Yeah. Uh, it just totally throws everything off. Yeah. So You're in good company. You're in yeah. great company. Luckily, my, my favorite Peanuts character is Pigpen, uh, yeah. not Charlie Brown. So, uh, mm-hmm. so dust is this mercurial character in the book that is the villain in some sense, but also the hero because without dust, we wouldn't be here. We actually have cosmic dust in the hemoglobin molecule in our blood, as I describe in the book. Uh, but more, more to the point, Alfred Nobel wanted to reward the uh, scientist who discovered the greatest uh, invention or discovery. And it was right around the turn of the century when uh, he died in 1896. And that was right when the X-ray machine was invented by William Rentgen in 1895 um, and this, or, or in 1896, when this uh, award first got started, uh, and the award was given in 1901 for the fir- uh, 1901 for the first time, and it was immediately for making the world better. This discovery enabled people to see broken bones and and tooth problems and so forth, and that was the paradigm for an invention that made the world immediately better. A single person invented it, and in, you know basically the preceding year, and so that became kind of my paradigm to look for. Well, how is it being given out today? And I found that in contrast, the award is now being given to three people for discoveries made decades ago uh, that has essentially no bearing on their human's daily life. So I started to think of myself, you know, in Judaism, the highest mitzvah that you can do is to take care of the needs of the dead because they can't repay you. So it's a totally selfless mitzvah. 
And I started to think, well, what if, you know, who's going to advocate for Alfred Nobel? Uh, he has no kids, no family, no heirs. So, it, you know, not to be too grandiose, I started to look at it from that perspective. And all the while I'm dealing with my own father's uh, un untimely passing away and thinking about his wishes and how to honor him and being asked by the Nobel committee to nominate the winners. So I started to go through this exercise. At any rate, um, I found that the Nobel committee had actually a different optimization that they were working towards, which is to maximize their attention, their fame, their credibility, and their power as a power broker, they are essentially a monopoly. There's no other award on the surface of the earth that confers the instantaneous celebrity, power, authority, et cetera, as the Nobel Prize. There's no other brand that has the strongest brand recognition. Uh, you may have heard rumors I read in uh, in the newspaper recently that Bill and Melinda Gates, you know, believe that they were in the short running for the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, and more power to them for all the great work that they do. But that was, you know, part of the divorce, you know, or uh, this is all allegedly according to, I don't know, may, it might have been in the New York Post, so take it with a grain of salt. I forgot where I read it, but that went into some of the timing because they announced this divorce separation after the Nobel Prize nomination deadline, which occurs in January. So they just announced mm -hmm. it in May. Um, some say that that was part, and again, it's all anonymous, so don't, you know, to take it with a grain of salt, as I said. Uh, but it shows you, that, you know, it's the world's richest man, right, and woman. So, uh, you know, that they are concerned with this shows you the power, and that's the only reason I'm bringing it up. Not, I don't take any pleasure from any of the personal struggles that they're going through. Just to illustrate that this is the most coveted of all things, and I start to look at it from the perspective of myself. Why did I want it so much? And I go through that in the book, and I basically come to see it as an idol, as a form of literal gilded graven idol with a picture of the patron saint of science and of peace and of economics and everything else, which is Alfred Nobel. And it's given out amidst a great fanfare on, two, on a holiday, a holy day in Sweden, which is actually like a national holiday, which you, have, yeah, which you have a feast. It's not his birthday. It's his death day. And it has all this regalia that you have to wear certain clothing. You have to bow down to the monarch, the god king of Sweden. Uh, and and you, uh, you have sort of this eschatological ceremony. And I started to think, you know, if, uh, if, if I can fall victim to it as a practicing Jew and I can worship a gilded graven image, you know, how about people that are secular and, and, and not as maybe rooted in the existence of a higher power as I am? If I can be, you know, swayed by the illustrious idolatrous powers, you know, maybe that's some service that I can do and kind of not diminish it to take it down, but use the power of the prize to reform it so that it can have some of the luster that it could have to agitate for betterment of the planet as Alfred Nobel so nobly, L.E., wanted for this prize. Mm. Yeah, fascinating. I think just the just the, the price of the book is worth uh, worth it just for the Nobel Prize story, and uh, his family creation of dynamite, glycerin, nitroglycerin, phenomenal stuff. Really, really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. So, so you uh, mentioned that you're a practicing Jew, uh, observant Jew. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Was, is that how you were raised? Um, no, I was raised a devout Catholic. <laughs> so both my uh, parents are, were biological Jews, which, you know, makes you Jewish. But, you know, there are, you know, we would go to synagogue maybe twice a year on Christmas and Easter. You know, we'd have uh, we'd, have, we'd celebrate Chris, Christmas and Easter with the religious tradition of, of Chinese food, uh, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, we, you know, we really were not observant at all. And uh, we'd We'd want to, uh, we'd want to, you know, really just kind of assimilate as much as we we, we were. My parents got divorced, unfortunately, and uh, my mother remarried an Irish Catholic man by the name of Keating, uh, Ray Keating, and uh, his family was quite large. He had nine brothers and sisters, Irish Catholic family from the Bronx, and uh, we just, I just fell in love with that tradition. And uh, my mother and older brother and I were uh, confirmed and baptized, and I actually became an altar boy in the Church of St. John and St. Mary in Chappaqua, New York, serving mm -hmm. as an altar boy under Monsignor Robert uh, Skelty, uh, Skelly, uh, who was uh, one of my uh, uh, closest mentors and friends and a wonderful man with a sense of humor and uh, warmth, gregariousness. And I used to pass the collection basket and pass out the communion wafers and have the Kiddush wine. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would do it all. And I learned so much about the, uh, the New Testament 
uh, for many years. And then when I was 12 years old, uh, Jewish boys at this time would be preparing for their bar mitzvah. I got my first telescope, as I said earlier, and my telescope took me in a different direction. It led me to learn about Galileo. It led me to learn about science and mathematics. And I became entranced, especially about Galileo, and learned how he was treated by the Catholic Church. And this is in the mid-1980s, late 1980s. At that time, and even to this day, Galileo has not been pardoned by the Catholic Church for his statement on uh, on heliocentrism, on the notion that the sun is the center of the solar system. Pope John Paul II uh, did rule, make an encyclical, I think it was called, that, that Galileo was right, but he was never formally pardoned. And so certainly back in the 80s, uh, and that was in 1992 that was issued, but certainly in the mid 80s when I was becoming fascinated by Galileo, he hadn't been, uh, the case had not been adjourned yet. So I was quite disillusioned and I kind of uh, fell out of uh, uh, beca- becoming a uh, practicing Catholic, stopped going to church, became lost, lose, lost my religion. How, how old are you? Became how old were you then? I was 13. So At be- 13, you came to these kind of big, big questions. That's a, that's a big theological questions. Well, I have 12, to say, you know, there was one other motive, Charles. I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but I'd wanted to go and become a, uh, a priest in the Catholic Church. Uh, and about the same time as a 13-year-old boy, you know, you're kind of developing some other things, some hormones, some other interests besides the night sky. Mm-hmm. And I found the telescope I could use for other, no, no, I, uh, but, but I started to think, well, do I really want to go all the way as a Catholic priest? You know, no, maybe not. And that was not an insignificant component to my motivation, to be honest Mm -hmm. with you, Charles. It wasn't all the purity of, uh, of kind of secular thinking and humanism, but rather, you know, partially had to do with disillusionment with the prospects of being celibate and taking a vow of celibacy in my life. But, but at any rate, um, and then throughout high school, you know, kind of science was my religion, stopped, stopped, uh, you know, really became really seriously committed to science and, um, and went to college. Was, uh, how, how did your, how did your stepfather deal with that? Um, you know, at that time, I think, you know, they, they, they were struggling too financially marriage, you know, eventually ended in divorce for them as well. Um, so, uh, you know, I think they had other, they had other issues. It wasn't, you know, we, I don't remember really going to church very much. Money was very tight for me growing up for them too. I almost had to leave college, uh, for lack of funds in my freshman year at the end of my freshman year. Uh, mm-hmm. thank goodness my university case, Western shout out to them. They provided funds for me and I did well in my SATs and everything. And so I was able to stay in school and thank God, because I wouldn't be talking to you now as a professor at the university of California, San Diego, if I was, you know, kicked out uh, for lack of funds. So things worked out. And uh, eventually after September 11th, I started to uh, peek my head up and real, I was flying on that day. I was supposed to fly to Chicago from, uh, from Los Angeles, where I was at Caltech uh, building bicep and getting all that together. And, uh, start to realize, wait a second, I know so much more about Catholicism, about atheism, about humanism, even about Islam, because of, you know, these events, I knew nothing about Judaism, I didn't know Hebrew, I never had a bar mitzvah. Uh, And I wanted to learn more about the religion of my birth, and uh, start to study with some rabbis and in Los Angeles, which is, you know, second biggest community outside of New York, fell in love with the community, the rituals started to teach myself Hebrew, read the Torah for the first time, in English, and then uh, slowly learned Hebrew, uh, very slowly, still learning it, and then uh, resolved that I wanted to get married to someone who was Jewish, and I was dating someone who was actually Catholic at the time, and that was uh, was a challenge, you know, to kind of separate from someone I cared about, because, you know, to find somebody I felt would continue the tradition, and my girlfriend at the time was a very serious Catholic and and not interested in converting to Judaism, and I wasn't going to convert you know, it stay converted to Catholicism after, you know, getting, uh, going back to Judaism. And, you know, this was a tough decision to make, but, but, uh, you know, I did it and, um, you know, I have, uh, nothing but, but good experiences to say for it. It's been a challenge, you know, learning Hebrew at age 29, 28, whatever. And then, you know, trying to raise a family and, and, uh, be a part of a community and, and, and continue learning. Uh, as a scientist, as a practicing scientist, and uh, trying to keep that separate too. You know, I never proselytize. It's not part of who I am. I like to try to set an example. And, um, and if people are interested in the example, I can, you know, I can debate, I can, I can, 
Uh, I have had many debates lately with um, with in- what's so-called intelligent design proponents, with Christians um, from places like the Discovery Institute, Stephen Meyer, and I'm looking forward to maybe having folks like William Lane Craig. These are prominent Christians on my podcast, Into the Impossible, which is on YouTube or on iTunes. Um, and uh, I love talking about the biggest picture issues because, like I said, life gets in the way, but this is the length and the life of your days. These are why we are here. This is what separates us from those that sweat and toil by the sweat of their brow they shall live. We need to recognize what makes us uniquely human. And when you have that experience, when you stop and think, wow, I just thought about the ultimate meaning of life. Stop for a second, guys. Think that I am human. I am a human being. I don't care if you believe in anything or nothing at all. But you just did something amazing that no other creature we know about in the known universe can do. It's an amazing thing, and we should do it more often. So you have kind of a rarity, a, a scientist who, well, I ask this as a question, a scientist who has a firm uh, and serious belief in God. Would you say that's a rarity or that's commonplace or what? Well, it's definitely a rarity. I think for me, the, the question comes down to one of, um, of practice versus uh versus belief scientists have problems with pure belief and without evidence and so i hear a lot of things like oh if i had evidence you know if god yeah. comes down and speaks to me like a friend of mine who's coming on my podcast lawrence krauss prominent you know born jewish you know ethnically jewish perhaps wrote a book called the a universe from nothing he had on you know woody allen another jew you know <laughs> Again, these are Jews. You know, I've had on Noam Chomsky, Jew. You know, these are Jews, but like you know, Bernie Sanders, Jewish. Yeah, you know, I don't consider these people particularly exemplary of Jewish, and that's because you know maybe they study, maybe they had their bar mitzvah. You know, maybe they're more Jewish in that sense than me. But I'll, you know, I can hold my own with any of them in terms of my knowledge of the Talmud, the Torah, you know, even the New Testament. And that's because typically what they'll do, Charles, is that they will stop their Jewish education at age 13. I didn't even start my Jewish education until age 28, 27. And so I came to it with the maturity, the intellect, the swagger, whatever you want of a mature PhD scientist. But I can look at it. I can look critically. I can talk about my qualms with it with with anybody. And that's okay because what does the word Israel mean in Hebrew? You know this, but for the benefit of maybe some listeners that don't, it means struggle with God. It means wrestle or fight with God. It doesn't mean intentionally just like, you know, be be a jerk and just like pick everything apart um, for your own self-aggrandizement as some militant atheist like Dawkins does. But but the point is you should struggle with it and you should wrestle with it and not be complacent because when you do, it's just like building a muscle, working out. If you don't work out, if you don't struggle with the weights, you're never going to develop anything. I want to develop those mental muscles that cause me to get stronger as a scientist, to know how to talk to people, the public who pay my salary, and that's part of my mission on my YouTube channel is digesting scientific findings in my field so that a lay person can understand them and appreciate them because they pay my salary. And also so, with religion as well. So did you come to God uh, the way Pascal came to with the Pascal's wager? Was it that kind of thought process? In my book, I describe Pascal's wager in the, and I should say for your listeners that may not know, you know, Pascal's wager is essentially saying that you should live as if God exists, because if you uh, live as if he doesn't, and he does, the punishments are, you know, infinite damnation. Um, whereas if you live as if he does and he doesn't, then you might have wasted some time or some money, you know, going to church or synagogue, but uh, you won't be punished because this doesn't exist. And if you live as if he does and he does, then you'll be rewarded by the infinite bliss of the afterlife, right? So it's all a kind of game theoretic approach to things. Um, I approached my father's final months in that Pascal's wager approach, as I described in the book. I had a difficult relationship with my father after being abandoned by him as a young seven-year-old. And um, and I had great challenge kind of wrestling with this notion of the fifth commandment of honoring him despite the damage that he did to me personally and psychologically, but also the damage that he could have done to my career, you know, as a 25, 26, 27 year old at the peak, at the height of my career, now having to honor him and take care of him, you know, the man who had not taken care of me, but, but then abiding by the practice of the fifth commandment, looking at it like a checklist and 
knowing that the Torah and the Talmud doesn't care why you give tzedakah or charity. It doesn't care if you wanted to do it. Who wants to give like 10%? Like, like oh, I really want to give away all this money. No, oh, I don't want to do it. I don't want to pay my taxes, but I do it because I have to. And I felt I had to do this. So that was part of the Pascal's wager approach. And it was unique because the fifth commandment is the only commandment that gives a reward. It says, um, honor thy mother and thy father uh, and your days will be lengthened on the earth. What does that mean? Does that mean I'm going to live longer? Does that mean like I'm going to be like safe? Or I don't know what it means. I still don't know what it means, but I know my life, that the life of my days was lengthened, that my life is better because of it. I know my kids and the relationship with my kids is better because of it. And my spouse is better because of it. Mm -hmm. So it's already been borne out to be true, Charles. And in that sense, Pascal's wager has paid off. I like to say, you know, as I've heard it said, you know, like the question is not, do I believe in God? But you should live as if like, there's a question if God believes in you. You can never prove if God exists. You can say you might have evidence. Some people have personal experiences. I'm not here to dispute that. They don't necessarily play out on a scientific realm with like a double blind study and, um, you know, and peer reviewed journal like science and nature. You can't imagine that occurring, not to deny people's experiences, but, um, but by the same token, uh, that's not the role of religion and faith. That's a whole notion of faith versus evidence. They're different things. And, uh, and I think a balanced person should strive to have both. So, oh, by the way, just as an aside, because uh, you you schooled me on um, on the um, Big Bang and a whole bunch of other things, there is only other one place in the Torah, the five books of Moses, where it gives a reward, and that's a uh, personal reward. That's in Deuteronomy twenty-two. Yeah, the mother bird. The mother bird away. That's yeah, right. You know what I use that for? And yeah. you know when I use that as a uh, as a Shabbat mm. uh, speech? You know, I use that on Mother's mm. Day because the mothers are more important than the fathers. Charles, I hate to break it to you. Because the mothers mm. are the only um, one of the two parents that's mentioned twice for rewards. They're mentioned in the fifth commandment and the mother mm-hmm. bird, right? The father's right, mentioned true. once. So got mm-hmm. people out there, you only get one mother, you only get one that's father, true. but uh, take care of your mother because uh, thank yeah. God my mother's still alive and well, and I love her to pieces. And we're going to be celebrating mm-hmm. her 80th birthday soon. I can't believe it. And uh, I love you, mom. Hopefully she'll see this mm-hmm. before her 80th birthday. That's great. That's great. All right. Last question for you. Last question, Brian. It's this one. We spoke a couple of weeks ago and I asked you, uh, knowing what you know about science, cosmology, big, everything that I wouldn't eat, I, I couldn't, in a hundred lifetimes, I'm just never going to figure out. But you, this is your field of study. I said, when you think of God, what do you think? I mean, you said that, Charles, that's a little complicated for now. But I said, give me a proof that, 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 God exists, and you said extravagance. And I thought about that over the past several days, and I really liked your definition. Could you just share with us before we go on what you meant by that? Yeah, of course, I would never say there's a proof, right? Because if there's a proof, then you wouldn't get credit. There's proof. Yeah, you, right, would, right. you wouldn't get a credit for believing in God, right? Their faith in God, right? Mm-hmm. If there's proof, I have proof that gravity exists. I have evidence that God, gravity exists, right? It's different. So now, is there evidence? Is there evidence that God exists? Well. So we look around and we know that there's only one human being. There's many types of monkeys. There's many types of birds. You know, one of my daughters was fascinated by reptiles. She has a book, Charles, is this thick. It's like 800 pages. It's like half of a percent of all the reptiles on earth. I don't know how she knows them all. It's something called a Sheshel Pusik. I I don't know where the heck they get these Mm. things from. Anyway, she knows them all. I don't know any of them. And I'm like, God, there's all these things. But why is there only one human being? Homo sapien sapien. It means man who knows that he knows. What does he know? He knows that he's going to die. No other animal Mm. knows that they're going to die. You know what else we know? We know that we have extravagance. There's more than one taste. There's more than one color. And you know what else I've been thinking about since I told you that extravagance? There's even more extravagance, Charles, because you and I see colors. We see, I see the red, white, and blue of the old glory behind you there. But I don't know that when I see that red color, I have no idea that I see the same red that you call red. In other words, there's extravagance upon extravagance upon extravagance. God, if you will, implanted upon us the ability to each experience extravagance upon a spectrum of possibilities. And each one of us has a spectrum. And just imagine 
you know, when you fly in a plane or you're looking down from a building in a city, each light that you see is perceived by every human being differently and each color and each taste. And we all see it, but we all experience it differently. It could be that we all experience just one color, black and white or no colors or each taste. It's just like salty and sweet. You know, there's four different dimensions on the tongue, you know, salty, sweet, bitter, hot, heat, uh, but that's all God could have done. And yet there's like, you know, like creme fraiche and there's like a Texas barbecue, you know, there's like infinite palette. Why is that? Right. Why is that? There's no need for that. There's infinite number of musical notes. There could be two, you know, you could actually encode all of human information, what's called the binary code, all of information, zero and one. That means you could encode all this information right now. I'm seeing the color red in your flag because of zeros and ones. That's proof. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if I'm there in person, it's slightly different. It's analog. It's not digitized, but it's amazing. And it's beautiful that we have this ability not only to each see a spectrum, but to see the spectrum uniquely individually. The candle flame that you see is different from my candle flame. The taste of a, a delicious you know, vegetable is different for you and a sweet for me. It's different. We'll never know it. We can only try to explain it in words and we can't capture it in words, Charles. I call that extravagance to the infinite power. And I find mm, that beautiful nice. and I just find it delightful. Outstanding, outstanding, outstanding. Losing the Nobel Prize, Brian Keating, outstanding. Thanks so much. I, 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 you got to come back on the show uh, another time. I would love uh, it. I have, we have so many things more to talk about, but I really enjoyed it. If you get this book, you'll have a history of the story of cosmology. You'll learn about the Nobel Prize. You'll learn about Brian's 12-year-old uh, self getting a telescope and the joy. And also what I found was interesting, and I don't even go on there, was the pictures the, the, in Galileo's own hand of what he was seeing. I said, holy smokes. It, it makes all the sense. Of the For those of you who look at the stars, um, planets, it's just absolutely amazing. <laughs> Brian, thanks so much. I, I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Charles. It's been a real pleasure for me as well. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Charles Mizrahi Show. If you're a new listener, welcome. If you've been listening for a while, we're glad to have you back. Either way, we'd love to know what you think of the show. Please leave a review if you listen on Apple Podcasts. Reviews make it easier for others to find the show. You can also see the video of the interview on the Charles Mizrahi Show channel on YouTube.